Today we're going to talk about image and what that means and how we want to have an image to ourselves and to others, and we think that's everything. But if we talk about one degree off, let's say today you were going to head to Ford Field in Detroit. The Lions are playing today. Let's say that after the service you wanted to be at that game and so you had your, your chopper ready and you were going to hop in there and you were going to head to, to Detroit. Okay, That would be the course you would take. You wouldn't just follow 96. You'd go in a straight line. Okay, So if you were going on the correct bearing, which would be, uh, let's see, uh, 104.25 degrees... And if you were going, if you went 154.181 miles, you would end up right at Ford Field. And I have that on the screen here, right there, right next to Comerica Park. So 154 miles from this very spot at 104.25 degrees, you end up at Ford Field. But what if you went that same distance and you were one degree off? Let's say you're compass on your helicopter was just one degree off, let's see where you'd end up. You'd end up in Canada. You'd end up in a whole new country, not to mention missing the lions. So every one degree off we are, the farther we go, the farther we are from where God wants us to be. Let's look at the uh, memory verse here. Let's say it together. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 2. And take it away. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Romans 12, 2. There's bracelets, and there's still more in the back if you didn't get one. Please take one. Image is everything. This is the world that we live in. I don't know, some of, some of you, maybe many of you are, might be old enough to remember this commercial. Who, who remembers this commercial? Or has seen this commercial? Anybody? Nobody has? Does anybody know who this is? Two? Three? Okay. This is Andre Agassi. He's a tennis player, a very good tennis player. And uh, he did a commercial for Canon cameras back, I think it was 1990. And he has this part in the commercial where he tips his sunglasses down and he says, image is everything. You can check it out. Look it up on YouTube sometime if you want. Anyways, but there's a story behind this that... I found out about recently. For him, he really believed that. That wasn't just something he said in a commercial on set. That was something that he lived. He wasn't just after being a good tennis player. His identity was in his appearance. He wore bright colors a lot. He would often take his shirt off to show how buff he was. He wore all kinds of cool headbands, and this was a part of an image that he wanted to portray, but his, the key part of his image was his hair, actually. He had this long, flowing hair that he had. But he actually wore a wig in the 1990s to cover up his baldness. In the French Open in 1990, he was in the final It was his first Grand Slam tournament. And he says, The evening before the match, I stood under the shower and felt my wig suddenly fall apart. And that that day he was frantically trying to put it together. He used 20 hair clips to try to hold it together. He says, Of course I could have played without my hairpiece, but what would all the journalists have written if they knew that all the time I was really wearing a wig? During the warming up training and before play, I prayed, not for victory, but that my hairpiece would not fall off. He lost that final because he was more worried about his hairpiece falling off 
than about how he was playing. When we are worried more about how we look to others than how we're really doing before God, we will lose, just like he did. Now, image is something. I mean, it's good to put your best foot forward. There's nothing wrong with that. It's good to be on your best behavior. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not good to just be just forward and up front with all of your, your, the worst things about you. You don't say, hi, how are you? You know, I, I have these problems and stuff. You know, you don't do that. I mean, there's images, something. But we get one degree off when image becomes everything. When we care more about looking good than being good. When we care more about looking Christ-like and appearing that way than actually being Christ-like. When we care more about what others think than what God thinks. Now we're one degree off. If you have your Bibles out, let's look at Romans 2. Romans 2, we're going to start at verse 17. Go through 29. It says, Now you, if you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and brag about your relationship to God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of infants, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then, who teach others, do you not teach yourself? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who brag about the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Circumcision has value if you observe the law, but if you break the law, then you become as though you had not been circumcised. If those who are not circumcised keep the law's requirements, what will they not be regarded as though they were uncircumcised, or circumcised rather? The one who is not circumcised physically and yet obeys the law will condemn you who even though you have the written code and circumcision, are a lawbreaker. A man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly, and circumcision and circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God." Verse 23, it says, You who brag about the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? Because we live in a world where image is everything and these are the winds that are blowing, when we're flying our craft, our lives in this storm, in these winds, it seems like we become one degree off because of it. Sometimes we want to know the truth, but we don't want to live the truth. There's a couple that I know, not in this, not in this congregation, but a couple that I knew, especially growing up. And they had, this, they had the worst marriage ever. They lived on opposite sides of the house. They almost never touched each other, ever. They would, when they would badmouth each other constantly behind their back, but they didn't believe in divorce, so they were okay. I uh, recently came upon this website called um, Charity Navigator, and it talks, it ranks charities based on all kinds of nonprofit organizations based on you know how how they do financially and and how transparent they are and how forthright they are about about their their accounting and, and that sort of thing. And I'm shocked 
at how many Christian charities have zero or no, or just one star by them. Now, not all of them, but there's, there's quite a few that have just one star. It's like they're trying to hide something. They're not transparent. You who preach against stealing, do you steal? There's a pastor who's, who's a pastor of a large church in the, in the Northwest. His name is Mark Driscoll. And uh, he's written a lot of books and sold a lot of books. I have, I have one or two of his. And uh, not too long ago, maybe a couple of years ago, he put this book out about marriage. And then it, it hit like the top of the bestseller list the first week. And then the next week, it was disappeared. And it came out that he hired a firm to buy a bunch of his books to make it hit that bestseller list. Too often, we don't live by the values we teach. I've got pages and pages here, and I'm not going to go through them all, of churches, pastors, Christians who do the wrong thing and it destroys people all the time. There's the Catholic abuse scandal that broke in 2002. The first headline on that was, Church allowed abuse by a priest for years. And it wasn't just one. There were many. A report came out by the Catholic Church itself and found that between 1950 and 2013, there were 17,259 victims of priests abusing people. 19 bishops in just this country were among the accused. Two-thirds of the bishops that were in office had hid something. They were just shuffling abusive priests around instead of doing proper discipline. There would be 3,000 lawsuits just through the year 2003. There would be 3 billion in settlements. 12 dioceses would file for bankruptcy. It's a disaster. All because of image. Somebody wrote about this. I think they said it really well. No atheist or anti-clericalist could have invented a story so perfectly calculated to discredit the message of the gospel as the depredations of these priests and the legalistic indifference of these bishops. No external enemy of the faith, no Attila or Barbarossa or Hitler could have sown so much confusion and dismay among the faithful as the Catholic Church's own bishops managed to do. And this is not just the Catholic Church either. When I was growing up, there was one homeschool program that was put out by somebody by the name of Bill Gothard. And he was, he was a very strict, conservative guy. I had some, some tapes from Michael W. Smith, and, and uh, they would require that if we were going to use that curriculum, that we had to burn those because that was rock music and that was sinful. A couple of years ago, he was accused of mistreating a lot of women in his employment, in his organization, including some underaged women, and he failed to report other abuse that was going on in his organization. And maybe the one that hurts the most is that I have read a number of times now that pornography is more prevalent in places where people are religious. 
If there's a state or a location where people say, I'm a highly religious person, more people say, I believe in God, pornography subscriptions are higher in those areas. When that movie Fifty Shades of Grey came out, you know, you can buy your movie tickets ahead of time. The pre-ticket, the pre-sales tickets that were bought were highest in the religious states. Mississippi, Arkansas, Kentucky, Alabama, Louisiana, South Carolina, Iowa, Tennessee. Those were the places where the most tickets were sold for that movie. In states where people more agree that even today miracles are performed by the power of God and I never doubt the existence of God, there are more pornography subscriptions. What the heck? You who say people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? And when we're caught, sometimes we don't even have the decency to say, you're right, I'm in the wrong. We'll defend ourselves and excuse ourselves and pretend like it's no big deal. There was a Christian leader named, and I'm not really, I'm not sure I'm pronouncing this name right, but Dinesh D'Souza. He writes a lot of books, and, um, and he was president of a, of a college in New York State, or New York City, rather. Well, World Magazine, which is a Christian magazine, reported that he checked into a hotel room with a woman that he was engaged to while he was still married to his wife of the past 20 years. And this was his response. That report is a clear attempt to destroy my career and my ministry. This is vicious masquerading as righteousness, and this is the behavior that is truly worthy of Christian condemnation. No, no remorse, no repentance, no, you know what, maybe, maybe there, you have something there. It's, this is worthy of Christian condemnation. Now, how many secrets do we have? How many things about us do we not want other people to know about? When was the last time that we said, I was wrong? Has it been a while? Is there something that has happened in your life that's just too shameful to talk about? There's sometimes that we don't even want to admit things to ourselves. Like we're trying to keep an image of who we are in our minds that's, that's pristine. I'm, I'm a good person. And so those mistakes that we made, the things that we did that were just wrong, we, we, we forget about those. That, that, that never happened. Or, or that wasn't my fault, that was somebody else's fault. Verse 24, as it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. God's name is blasphemed when we say one thing and we do another. That discredits God. That shows faith is a joke. It's something we just say. We're just blowing smoke. God isn't better than the things of this world and the ways of sin. He doesn't come through. He isn't mighty to save. That's what it says. There's a documentary about the Catholic abuse scandal, and there was a, they interviewed uh, some parents of a little girl who was, who was abused. And this is what the dad said, I've made up my mind there is no God. I do not believe in a God. All of these rules, everything they've made up is by man. God's name is blasphemed. Look at the screen here with me. and Let's answer the question together. Can those be saved who do not turn to God from their ungrateful and impenitent ways? By no means... Scripture tells us that no unchaste person, no idolater, adulterer, thief, no covetous person, 
no drunkard, slanderer, robber, or the like is going to inherit the kingdom of God. Scripture has some very strong words for people who just continue on sinning like it's no big deal. Or people who use grace as a license to just sin. But the thing is, is that if we're in Christ, if He's died on the cross for our sins, if He's taken those away, if we have forgiveness from God because of what He did, then sin is not our master. There is no excuse for sin at all. There's only repentance. When, when we sin, there, there's no excusing that. There's no dismissing it, downplaying it. There's just repentance. I'm, I'm sorry, Lord. I'm wrong. What are my consequences? 1 John 3, 6, No one who lives in Him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen Him or known Him. That's some pretty strong words there. When we can't confess our sin, when we're trying to maintain an image to ourselves or to other people, when we can't admit, you know, I was wrong, please forgive me. When we can't confess our sin, it controls us. It controls us. We're controlled by the things that we can't confess or we can't admit to ourselves because we have an image to maintain and we will do anything to keep that image because it's just too painful or too difficult to, for us to think of ourselves as somebody who might do this. There are stories that I read of pastors who raid the church's funds to pay hush money to some woman that they slept with so that they can maintain that image. That's so heartbreaking. That's sin controlling us. Getting us to do things that in other circumstances, we would never do that. And when we can't confess our sin, it affects the whole church too. Because then church becomes a place for perfect people. People who don't need to repent. People who don't have any problems. Church becomes a place of image instead of a place of healing. And so people who are actually seeking to be healed from their past things that they've done and looking for God's grace, they, they find a bunch of people who don't need grace and they think, oh, I don't belong here. God's grace means that sin does not define us. When Christ took our sins away, they have no power over us at all. It's, it's, this, is, this is what grace is. We are not controlled by that. We don't have to maintain an image. Romans 6.14, For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under law, but under grace. I don't know how much more clear it can be. Sin does not control us. We can confess it. We can own up to it. We can admit it. We can say, you know what? I was wrong. I'm in Christ. I don't have to maintain an image. Since our righteousness is in Christ, we don't have an image to maintain. If we are right with God by what Christ has done, then our image is in Him. We, we can say, hey, I'm a sinner. We can admit that. I, I've done this. I, I told that lie. I, I did what was wrong here. We don't have to impress anybody because we have impressed God by what Christ has done. We don't have an image to maintain. We don't have to be worried about shame either. The shame of being sinful, doing something wrong. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. There's power there. We are free 
from the chains of what we have done, the things in our past. We are under grace. Those things don't control us. They don't define us, and they can't shame us into doing wrong things because we are under grace. We will keep our eyes focused on who Jesus is because that's where our righteousness is, and we are going to follow in his footsteps. When you have God's approval, you can disregard shame to do what God wants. We don't have to be controlled by that shame. Shame is not our master. We are not under laws and codes. We are under grace. And all of us not only need to be able to confess our sins, we all need people in our lives where we can admit what we've done. We don't have to broadcast it in a newspaper necessarily. We need to confess it to somebody though. We need to be able to admit it to ourselves. And we need somebody else to say, you're forgiven. We need to be able to constantly say, or throughout our lives, we need to be able to say, I've done this. I feel horrible about it. And we need to be able to hear, God forgives you because you are under grace. Find a believer you can trust and confess your sins. Confess it. Be open about it. I hope that you have somebody in your life where you can do that and you have done that. James 5.16 Therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other that you may be healed. If we're under grace, we can do that. Everyone who does evil hates the light can't confess those things that we want to keep in the dark and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. When we confess our sins and admit that, then God looks good. God is praised. Sin thrives when it hides. When we can't admit it to ourselves, when we can't admit it to anyone else, sin thrives. We need to get it out. We need to be able to admit it to ourselves and we need to be able to have people that we trust where we can share that. Evil thrives on secrets and lies because we will have these secrets and we will make up these lies to protect our image. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, what did they do? They hid themselves. As if God doesn't know everything and can't see everything. They they had to hide. They still had to hide. Pastor Nate and I, he's he's kind of the one that that uh, I... I have this trusting relationship with he and we we tell each other all kinds of stuff things that we're struggling with things that we've done wrong and we encourage each other and we pray for each other and I have to say that that is the most real that church is for me is when I can say I've done this and he says you're forgiven God's grace covers that Let's pray about that. And it was amazing how many times when it was Friday, neither one, had our, neither one of us had our sermons done, and we were pressed for time, but we said, we got to meet. We would make time to make that happen because it was so important to us. I wish that all of you could have that too. Verse 29, now a man is a Jew, we can read Christian, if he is one inwardly and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from men, but from God. Let's seek to please God, not men. 
Let's seek to be righteous before God, not to have an appearance. Let's walk the way that Christ has walked and embrace the, the shame that our sin has so that we can be free from it. On that last day when we're standing before God, we're not going to care what other people think anymore. No opinions are going to matter anymore. There's only one opinion that's going to matter. And that's the one whose opinion we are standing before. And wholehearted commitment to Christ is not going to be good for our image because doing the right thing is not going to make people like you. The truth is not something that there's a lot of people who really want to hear that all the time. But we have something better than an image. We have identity in Christ and nobody can touch that. If you belong to Christ, then nobody can take that away. Image is not everything. Jesus is everything. He's the one who embodies the grace that we've received. He's the one who's taken our guilt and our shame away. And he's the one in whom that we can say, I'm wrong, please forgive me. I've done this. I need God's grace. Cross out on your outlines, cross out the word image and write Jesus there instead. Jesus is everything. Let's walk in his image. Let's bow our heads. Lord our God, we've all done things that we are not proud of, even things that we are deeply ashamed of. Help us to be able to confess those to you and to other people, Lord, who we trust, people that you put in our lives for such a purpose. And Lord, Help us to know that forgiveness and that healing that comes from Jesus Christ and the shame that he bore so that we would not fear shame. And Lord, that we would embrace who you are and your grace to us. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.